Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Salter. I'm one of the uh, chief residents uh, for quality improvement and patient safety. And uh, it is my pleasure to be introducing today's uh, ground round speakers. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Sakaris. Uh, Dr. Sakaris is a professor of medicine and chief of the division of hematology at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He earned a medical degree and a master's degree in clinical epidemiology from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Sakaris completed his postgraduate training at Harvard University, finishing an internal medicine residency at uh, Mass General Hospital and a fellowship in hematology oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. He is chair of the medical advisory board of the aplastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndrome International Foundation, and formerly chaired the Oncolo Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee of the FDA, the MDS Research Fund of the Dresner Foundation, and the Cleveland Clinic Enterprise Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, where he also vice was where he was also vice chair for clinical research of the Cancer Center. An invited speaker at numerous meetings, grand rounds, and conferences, Dr. Sakaris is a member of the American Society of Hematology where he has served on the executive committee, uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the Southwest Oncology Group Leukemia Committee. His research focuses on patients with myelodysplastic syndrome and older adults with acute myeloid leukemia. And he has been the national and international primary study investigator on several phase one, two and three trials. He is the author or co-author of over 350 manuscripts and 650 abstracts published in leading journals. He was the inaugural editor-in-chief of the American Society of Hematology Clinical News Magazine. He is on the editorial board of several journals, has written over 50 essays for the New York Times, and has authored seven books. Please welcome Dr. Sakaris. Thank you so much. What a pleasure it is to um, be given the privilege to speak at Grand Rounds today. Um, I am going to talk about myelodysplastic syndromes. Um, and I'm going to start off with a patient and my uh, fictitious patient will run through the entirety of the uh, presentation. I'll then talk about uh, definitions and the notions of risk, how we uh, ameliorate anemia, tackle thrombocytopenia, and try to modify multi-lineage dysplasia in these patients. We'll then talk about patients who have higher risk MDS and try to wrap it all up. So I'll start off with a patient. This is a 72-year-old woman who comes into our clinics with worsening fatigue, and she says, and I'm quoting, it feels like my legs are encased in cement, end quote. And this is actually something one of my patients said to me. She now has to use a handicap tag to park close to the casino entrance where she goes gambling. Her past medical history is notable for hypertension, coronary artery disease, and smoking. And this is what her labs look like. Her white count is normal with a normal neutrophil count. She doesn't have any blasts in her periphery. Her hemoglobin, however, is low at 7.8, and she has an MCV that's elevated at 102. Her platelet count is normal. Her reticulocyte count is inappropriately low for the degree of anemia that she has at 0.4%, and her erythropoietin level is high at 80. She undergoes a number of tests to work up anemia, including uh, EGD and colonoscopy. Um, she has a bunch of vitamin levels that are assessed along with thyroid function and even has an autoimmune panel, uh, all of which come back completely normal. This then prompts a bone marrow biopsy that shows a hypercellular marrow for her age at 70%, with dyserythropoiesis and 25% ring sideroblasts. And she is diagnosed with MDS with single lineage dysplasia with ring sideroblasts with 2% blasts. Her cytogenetics show no growth. This happens about 20% of the time in people who have myeloid dysplastic syndromes. However, a myeloid next generation sequencing panel shows that she has an SF3B1 mutation with a variant allelic frequency of 26%. So let's talk about what she has. Uh, myeloid dysplastic syndrome is um, described as a heterogeneous collection of clonal hematopoietic disorders derived from an abnormal multipotent progenitor cell characterized by a hyperproliferative bone marrow, dysplasia of the cellular elements, and ineffective hematopoiesis. Now, my dad, who is a newspaper reporter and editor, would have taken me out to the woodshed and flogged me 
for writing something that's as convoluted as this definition. I'm embarrassed to say I have actually written definitions similar to this in review articles and textbooks. So let me try to simplify it. MDS is a type of cancer. And like other cancers, it has a clonal origin. It results in excess growth of cells that ignore signals to stop growing and that also encroach on normal tissues in the body. In this case, the normal bone marrow elements that then results in a compromise in uh, peripheral blood counts. The incidence rate is approximately 4.5 per 100,000 people per year, which translates to about 20 thousand new diagnoses per year in a prevalence that we estimate to be around 60 to 80,000 people living with this in the U.S., although we really don't know what the prevalence is. Men get it more than women, whites more than blacks. And one of the most common questions that I get from my patients is what caused my MDS? The median age of diagnosis is about 71 years. And a lot of times we try to blame previous exposures to radiation therapy or chemotherapy for other cancers or for rheumatologic conditions. But this is far from straightforward. This is a study we conducted at Cleveland Clinic where we tried to figure out if men who had received radiation therapy for prostate cancer were at higher risk of developing MDS subsequently. Now that makes intuitive sense because men get radiation therapy in the area of the pelvis that produces a lot of the bone marrow, but it doesn't make face validity sense, because if this were the case, I should have a clinic full of men who have MDS uh, who also have been treated for prostate cancer in the past, and I just simply don't. So we looked at 11,000 patients at Cleveland Clinic, ha about half of whom had received some form of radiation therapy for their, for their prostate cancer. The other half, our control group, had undergone radical prostatectomy. When we drill down to the numbers at the bottom of this slide, it appears that there is a higher number of men who were diagnosed with MDS who received radiation therapy at 25 versus only six in the radical prostatectomy group. But this is again a complicated analysis because of um, confounding factors. Uh, men who are older are more likely to receive radiation therapy for prostate cancer. They're also more likely to develop MDS. We also had a phenomenon that's similar to here at University of Miami, where we have people who come here for one-stop shopping of care of their medical problems. So we were concerned that we had a lot of men who came for prostatectomies who were then lost to follow-up, and we actually didn't know if they had MDS. But we were able to correct for that, looking at the frequency with which their PSA was followed. So when we corrected for all of this, what we found is that the incidence rate for men who received radiation therapy for their prostate cancer of developing MDS was actually quite similar to what we would have expected in MDS rates using SEER data. SEER is the Surveillance and, and Epidemiology Results Program of the CDC and the National Cancer Institute. But it's even a more complicated story than that because uh, what we were able to conclude is that they, there didn't appear to be higher rates of developing MDS for those who received radiation therapy during their lifetimes. What we're increasingly recognizing, and I'll try to make this point um, during this presentation, is that MDS takes years or even decades to develop. So it may be that in a much younger man who opts to receive radiation therapy for prostate cancer, he may be at higher risk of developing MDS, but in a typical 70, 75-year-old, 65-year-old man who receives radiation therapy for prostate cancer, that rate doesn't appear to be much higher. Well, what about folks who receive radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer? Um, so this is another study that we uh, conducted actually using SEER Medicare data, where we looked at people who receive radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer and compared them to those who underwent um, resection of their thyroids alone uh, for that treatment and looked at the eventual development rates of either MDS or myeloproliferative neoplasms. In a separate publication, we also looked at rates of developing acute leukemias. In about 150,000 people who had been treated for their thyroid cancers, we were able to identify uh, about 70 or 80 of whom developed MDS or myeloproliferative neoplasm. And eventually we're able to conclude that the relative risk of developing MDS for those patients who underwent surgery and received radioactive iodine was about fourfold higher than those who didn't receive the radioactive iodine. And this is now part of the risk benefit analysis in patients who receive radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer. Now, how is MDS classified? The World Health Organization basically recapitulates what we see clinically. And what we tend to see 
clinically are patients who have a single lineage dysplasia, so a single cytopenia like our patient that we're describing who has an isolated anemia, those folks we would say have MDS with single lineage dysplasia with or without ring sideroblasts. We also see patients who have multiple cytopenias. Those folks have MDS with multi-lineage dysplasia, once again, with or without ring sideroblasts. We have a special group of patients who have a deletion 5Q abnormality. We'll talk about that in a little while. And then we have patients who have excess blasts. Now, once a patient starts to have excess blasts with MDS, that person gets closer and closer to being diagnosed as having acute myeloid leukemia. So we have uh, patients who have excess blast type 1 who have 5 to 9% blasts, those who have excess blast type 2 who have 10 to 19% blasts, and once a person has 20% blasts, we officially say that that person has acute myeloid leukemia. So you can see how MDS is a multi-step process that starts to slouch towards being acute myeloid leukemia the longer a person lives with MDS. Now, even diagnosing MDS is not that easy. Um, I'm privileged to be the study chair of a National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute natural history study of MDS um, that looks like it's going to be going on for at least 10 years of follow-up. In this study, we're collecting both clinical data, quality of life data, and actual tissue samples from 2,000 patients diagnosed with MDS in the U.S., along with another 500 who have idiopathic cytopenia of undetermined significance, and another 1,000 who were thought to have MDS, but actually turned out to have a different diagnosis altogether. And what we have found already in this study is that 40% of the time, 40% of the time, there's disagreement in the diagnosis between local pathologists and our duo of central pathologists who are highly skilled at diagnosing MDS. What, when we drill down to figure out whether those were really clinically meaningful differences in diagnosis, it turns out that it, it is clinically meaningful about 20% of the time. So 20% of the time, a local pathologist may say a person has MDS, and our central pathologist says, no, 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 it's actually acute leukemia. Or a local pathologist may say this isn't MDS at all, and a central pathologist says, well, in fact, it is. So it emphasizes how critical it is when we're seeing patients with MDS to um, have those bone marrows analyzed by skilled pathologists like Jennifer Chapman uh, to see if it really is MDS, and if so, what subtype of MDS. Now, we don't have a staging system for MDS, despite the fact that it's a cancer. So we use this really quirky prognostic scoring system as our default staging system. And this scoring system recapitulates, again, what's clinically and intuitively fairly obvious. So a patient who comes into my clinic who has a low blast percentage, let's say 1% or 2% blasts in the bone marrow, has good risk cytogenetics. And in MDS, we consider good risk to be those patients who have a normal karyotype, deletion 5Q, deletion 20Q, or minus Y, and who has an isolated cytopenia, that person actually has a very good prognosis with MDS. On the other hand, a person who comes into my clinic who has 18% blasts, which is very high, poor risk cytogenetics, so abnormalities of chromosome 7 or complex cytogenetics, and multiple cytopenias, has a median survival that's measured in less than a year and a half. Now, if you accept my premise that the IPSS is essentially our default staging system for MDS, and IPSS categories low, intermediate 1, intermediate 2, and high represent stages 1, 2, 3, and 4, then stage-for-stage stage survival for MDS is as bad or worse than it is for non-small cell lung cancer. And I'll say that one more time. Stage-for-stage stage survival in MDS is as bad or worse than it is for non-small cell lung cancer. So you can see why I started this presentation by saying, but simply, MDS is a type of cancer, and how important it is to impart that knowledge that this is a serious diagnosis considered a cancer to our patients, so that when we start to talk about prognosis and talk about treatments with our patients, they understand um, the implications of it. Now, we've evolved to a much more complicated scoring system, the revised IPSS, which actually puts more weight on very poor risk carry type than it does on a high blast percentage. But what we found is that these, either the IPSS or revised IPSS, actually it aren't that accurate in patients who receive some type of therapy for their MDS. We were one of two centers in North America to contribute data to the revised IPSS. Um, when we did contribute those data, 
actually a lot of it was sent back to us with the message, no, 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 your patients actually receive some sort of, ther some sort of therapy. We're only interested in including patients in the revised IPSS who didn't receive a drop of therapy. So we have this disconnect with what I just described as our staging system in MDS that actually may not be that relevant in patients who receive therapy eventually. This is a study we conducted through the MDS Clinical Research Consortium. This was a $16 million grant we received to um, organize the first essential cooperative group of MDS centers in the US where we showed that the IPSS and revised IPSS actually aren't very accurate in patients who, re who eventually receive hypomethylating agents, but other systems may be more accurate. It turns out that the IPSS and revised IPSS aren't accurate at all in patients after they've received therapy also because these systems aren't what we call dynamic. They're good at one point in time in a patient who never receives therapy at diagnosis. Once that patient evolves or has received therapy, we need to turn to something else. Put into this complexity of MDS, the fact that about 95 or 96% of patients with MDS have an identif identifiable genomic abnormality um, that itself carries some component of risk. This is a study that we conducted that was appeared in Nature Genetics in 2017, where we're at, we identified driver genes that could be classified into molecular subtypes and that were differentially associated with disease severity. To put this figure in very simple terms, the only good risk molecular abnormality that patients with MDS have is the SF3B1 abnormality, the very same one that our patient has in this presentation. Everything else confers either an intermediate or poor risk. The poorest risk of all is to have multiple molecular abnormalities. So it begs the question though, how do we assess risk when we're trying to think of clinical characteristics, morphologic, pathologic characteristics, and genetic characteristics? Well, this can only be done really with machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches given the complexity of all of this. This is a study that we conducted that was uh, led by a junior colleague of mine, Aziz Naza, who has actually since left medicine and joined Amazon uh, to give you an idea of just how smart a guy he is. Um, in which we looked at all of those different components to figure out the best way to classify patients and to develop a prognostic scheme that was actually dynamic, that could change over time. We developed this using almost 1,500 patients who were at Cleveland Clinic and at a lab in Germany and validated it in 830 patients who were collected by uh, Moffitt up in Tampa and we're able to show that machine learning and artificial intelligence outperformed every other system we have available in uh, terms of prognosis for both overall survival and how long it took for a patient to develop leukemia and where dynamic could change over time. So I think the future in staging and prognostication in MDS is actually going to involve uh, inputting data onto an online platform um, and allowing the machines to take over and helping us advise our patients about their prognosis. Now I'm gonna shift gears here just for a second and, and just kind of reflect on something. It's, it's rare in our careers that we read one article that kind of transforms the way we think about the diseases we treat. But this was just such an article. This was a publication that came out of the Atomic Bomb Research Institute in Japan. And this itself has a tragic history. When um, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, it turns out that ground zero uh, was actually a medical school. And of course, everyone who was in that medical school was killed instantly. There was one medical student who happened to be visiting his parents th that weekend away from Hiroshima and came back to find that he had lost all of his classmates. And he decided to dedicate his life to studying the long-term effects of the atomic bomb on a variety of diseases. So this publication came out and showed that um, patients who were diagnosed with MDS in the 1980s and 1990s um, were much more likely to develop MDS if they had uh, been exposed to the atomic bomb than if they hadn't. Not only that, the rates of MDS increased the closer to the epicenter they were and the rates of higher risk MDS increased the closer to the epicenter they were. Now think about the implications of that. We're talking about an exposure that preceded a diagnosis of MDS by 40, even 50 years. What that says to us is that the prodrome, the, the amount of years that has to pass before an MDS diagnosis is made is years or even decades 
um, before that inciting um, mutation actually occurs that then leads to a cascade of other mutations. Think about the implications of that for whether or not patients can have a heritable genetic abnormality that leads to their MDS. So one day I was in clinic and I saw a patient who was in his 60s who had a new diagnosis of MDS. And he told me that he actually had a twin brother who had MDS. And you can imagine that this sort of event happens about once in a career where you have uh, twins with the same rare diagnosis. So we chatted with him and he talked with his brother who also agreed to come into our clinic and actually said to us, we don't even know if we're identical twins. We've, we've, we've never been informed. They both graciously agreed to give us um, blood and bone marrow samples. And we were able to determine that they uh, both shared a germline dead box helicase DDX41 mutation. Now, both brothers um, actually agreed to be treated with the drug lenalidomide, and I'll talk about that in a second. And um, both stopped their lenalidomide for different reasons. Um, my patient underwent shoulder surgery and informed me he was gonna stop taking the drug. And I said, wait a second, don't stop taking the drug. It's actually working really well for you. But he said, uh, you know, the hell with you, doc, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. And that's often what patients do. And he continued to respond to that two months of drug that he received for a full year. Same thing happened to his brother, who was admitted to the hospital with an infection, had only received two months of the exact same drug and continued to respond to that drug for six months. So um, what we found in this study, which was really cool, um, which we published in Cancer Cell about five years ago, is that about two and a half percent of patients with MDS and with secondary leukemia had the DDX41 abnormality. For many of them, it was in fact a germline abnormality and among those who were treated with this drug lenalidomide, 100% responded to the drug. So neat example of not only finding an abnormality that was heritable and didn't really rear its ugly head in terms of a disease, MDS, for six decades, um, but also a potential indicator of patients who had a preferential response to a very specific type of drug. So let's get down now to actually how we treat MDS uh, now that I've spent about half this presentation talking about definitions and the notions of risk. Um, this is an algorithm that uh, we developed for the American Society of Hematology Education session a couple of years ago, um, talking about how to treat MDS. And, we, and with lower risk MDS, so remember those patients who don't have a lot of blasts, who have an isolated cytopenia, who have relatively good risk karyotypic abnormalities, we divide it into what that patient's blood counts look like when they walk through the door. So for patients who have no transfusion needs and have a good quality of life and this MDS was just picked up, we actually don't do anything other than observe these patients every month or two or six months, depending on the severity of their cytopenias and their disease course. This is what one of my patients once referred to as having mild displeasure syndrome. He didn't enjoy fighting the traffic to come into Cleveland every three months to see me, but in other, in other areas, the, the MDS didn't actually affect him very much. Then we focus on those patients who have a predominating cytopenia of anemia or thrombocytopenia or those who have multiple cytopenias. For those patients who have a predominating cytopenia of anemia, the most common treatment that we offer is either erythropoiesis stimulating agents or a new drug called loose patercept. Uh, the likelihood that an ESA, an erythropoiesis stimulating agent such as erythropoietin or darbapone is going to work in a patient is somewhere between 15 and 40%. We conducted a meta-analysis uh, over a decade ago that showed a response rate of 40% over 20 years of published literature. A more recent randomized trial of darbapoietin in Europe showed an initial response rate of only 15% to darbapoietin, but over time uh, that expanded to 35% of patients. Who is more likely to respond to an ESA? Well, again, this is clinically and intuitively fairly obvious. If a patient walks into my clinic, already has a sky-high serum EPO level, and I've seen patients with serum EPO levels in the thousands, and is already dependent on red blood cell transfusions, then giving that person more exogenous EPO isn't going to help very much. On the other hand, patients who walk into my clinic who have a relatively low serum EPO level and low for MDS is less than 100, like our patient who has a serum EPO level of 80, and hasn't yet started to require transfusions, the likelihood that an ESA is gonna work is much higher at almost 
Now there's another drug that was just FDA approved last year called Lucepetercept. It works through SMAD2 slash 3 signaling and probably in abrogating some of the pro-inflammatory, pro-apoptotic cytokines, such as um, IL-1, TGF-beta, TNF-alpha, uh, that are associated with MDS. In this study, the response rate for patients who had ring sideroblasts associated with their MDS, like our patient, was 38%. Um, compared to 13% for patients who just received placebo, which is really important in MDS to have a placebo-controlled trial because a lot of these older adults may have some anemia due to some incipient uh, GI bleeding that uh, fortuitously resolves in the course of a study like it probably did on this study. The duration of response, and this is typical of treatments for MDS, was a median of about 31 weeks. Our patient is treated with darbapotin, her uh, hemoglobin improves, but then, then uh, slips after about 10 months of therapy. She has a repeat bone marrow biopsy that now shows a deletion 5Q abnormality. And in this patient, we would consider treating her with lenalidomide. This would be an on-label treatment for patients with a deletion 5Q abnormality. Lenalidomide was developed from thalidomide, which of course has an awful history and causes infocomelia in, uh, uh, when, it was, when pregnant women were treated uh, with it for um, morning sickness and for anxiety. Um, it never actually reached the United States uh, due to the heroic efforts of uh, Dr. Kelsey, who was uh, working at the FDA. Her actual first assignment at the FDA was to review the thalidomide application. And because she was uh, surprised at the paucity of side effects that were submitted along with the application from the uh, manufacturer of thalidomide, um, she, she really delayed and delayed and delayed approving it until these case reports started to come out of these horrible side effects to thal thalidomide. That's really why we didn't have as much of a thalidomide tragedy here in the US as the rest of the world. But because of this background, lenalidomide is very closely regulated. And in fact, it too uh, does cause teratogenicity. There were five trials that looked at lenalidomide, um, the most important of which was a randomized study in patients who have the deletion 5Q abnormality that led to a response rate of 61%, which is about double what we typically see for any drug in lower risk MDS. The response duration was two years, which is also approximately double what we typically see in lower risk MDS. Our patient is treated with lenalidomide for 22 months, has a nice improvement, but then her blood counts worsen. A repeat bone marrow biopsy shows that she now has multi-lineage dysplasia, MDS. So in this case, we would probably want to deal with her low platelet counts first because they are quite low. And one of the drugs we can consider is a thrombopotent mimetic, uh, such as l ramiplostim. Ramiplostim was looked at in a randomized study in which we participated. Uh, where patients receive ramiplostim or placebo. Um, uh, patients uh, who were enrolled, uh, some patients did have excess blasts, which is something that those of us on the steering committee actually recommended against, uh, but something that the manufacturer of ramiplostim plowed ahead with uh, to enroll anyway, despite our counsel. When we looked at the primary endpoints of clinically significant bleeding events or platelet transfusion events, these were improved. Excuse me, Dr. Sekaris, you yeah. have exactly one minute to finish. Yep, I got it. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Okay. Uh, these patients um, did uh, have improvement in those who received ramiplostim, but also a uh, excess rate of transformation to acute myeloid leukemia for those who got the ramiplostim. So uh, this is a drug we use for those who had lower risk MDS, but not those who have excess blasts because those were the patients who transformed to acute myeloid leukemia. I'm going to finish up here by talking about treatment of multi-lineage dysplasia in higher risk MDS. And what we use in these cases are hypomethylating agents, drugs like azacitidine and decitamine. Um, in this trial in lower risk MDS, we have an overall response rate of 60% for patients who get these drugs. The response lasts for about a year and a half. Um, in patients who have higher risk MDS, uh, we use the same drugs. And in these patients, this is the only prospective randomized trial that led to a survival benefit uh, in MDS for those patients who received um, azacitidine. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I want to thank all of you for uh, listening today and appreciate the chance to uh, to present. I'm going to stop sharing. Dr. Sekris, thank you so much. That was really great. Lots of things to talk about. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have time. 
I'm sure those will email you or find you uh, in the hallway and, uh, and, and grab you for some questions. Let's go on to the next speaker, but thank you so much. Okay. So our uh, next, piece, next speaker is going to be Dr. Ross Scalise. Uh, Dr. Scalise is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and Director of Educational Technology Development at the Gordon Center for Simulation and Innovation in Medical Education. Dr. Scalise received his undergraduate degree from Princeton University and his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He completed residency in internal medicine in the US Air Force and served more than seven years on active duty as an internist and flight surgeon. In 2000, Dr. Scalise began work at the uh, UM Jackson Medical Center. And in 2003, he joined the full-time faculty at the Gordon Center, where he completed a research fellowship in medical education. He maintains specialty certification by the American Board of Internal Medicine and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Scalise is active clinically and as a teacher of medical students and residents, as well as physician assistant and nursing students, particularly in the areas of cardiology, neurology, and clinical skills. At UM's medical school, Dr. Scalise co-chairs the executive curriculum committee, co-directs major competency assessment programs, and is a founding fellow of the Academy of Medical Educators. Dr. Scalise's research focuses on innovative uses of simulation for competency-based training, and he has a special interest in the development and implementation of simulations for assessment. Dr. Scalise has served on test material development committees of the National Board of Medical Examiners in the US, and for more than a decade collaborated with the Royal College of Physicians of Canada to incorporate simulations into their high stakes national certification exams. Dr. Scalise has been an invited speaker at numerous international conferences addressing topics related to simulation-based health professions education. He has co-authored some of the most frequently cited papers in the field, including the Best Evidence Medical Education Collaboration Systematic Review on the features of high fidelity simulation that lead to effective learning. Please welcome Dr. Scalise. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that kind introduction. Thanks, Michael, for that great presentation. Uh, it's gonna be hard to follow uh, that terrific talk, but I'll do my best to keep this informative. I'm going back, not uh, to my education uh, areas, but back to my clinical roots in general internal medicine. Um, and I've been asked to give this update, which was kind of a daunting task to choose from the, the wide swath of internal medicine topics that, that one could cover. Um, I've chosen to speak on adult screening and preventive services because I think this has broad applicability, not just for general internists, but across all of our subspecialties. And because these recommendations are based in uh, epidemiology and uh, population health, um, they have large patient effects um, as their potential. So my objectives, I'm going to focus even within the area of preventive services on just two areas. Uh, immunizations, um, and we will focus on the recommendations of the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And also, just very briefly, I'm going to touch on a recent uh, update to some cancer screening recommendations that came out from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Again, you know, well, how this came to mind was, I think vaccines are on everybody's mind, right? Uh, every day in the news, practically, we're hearing about it, especially in the context of COVID. Um, but the recommendations around immunizations um, change frequently, so it's hard to keep up. Um, recently, I've been attending in the residence internal medicine clinic in ACC, and frequently uh, we have to go back to those immunization schedules to make sure we're giving the, the latest health maintenance care uh, to our patients. And it's not just in our clinical realm, of course, you know, in our personal lives too. I'm sure all of you have been approached by family, friends, even strangers. I was in Publix the other week on my way home from work in scrubs and somebody, hey, you're a doctor. Uh, what do you think about this vaccine, COVID? Um, I'm not gonna talk about COVID today, but because uh, there are others who are far more expert than I am in that topic, um, but focus on a couple of other areas. And for those of you who like me still have to maintain your board certification, these preventive services and immunization questions are favorite ones on ABIM exams. If we have time at the end, I'm also gonna talk about a little personal experience of mine recently that uh, had especially the cancer screening uh, recommendations as, as top of mind for me. 
So what I'd like to do to keep this interactive is actually use an audience response system. Um, we had trialed this earlier and it was all working fine, but I'm not seeing the polling controls right now. So Laura is gonna help me. Um, let's launch a poll. And what I would like you all to do is just answer about your ABIM certification status. For those of you who aren't familiar with the polling in Zoom, Are those, uh, are those visible to folks? Because I'm not seeing the polling window for some reason now. Um, so choose if you're still in training, you're not board certified yet. If you're like me, have to recertify every 10 years in general internal medicine. Some of the subspecialists are maintaining certification but are only doing it in their subspecialty. And the last two choices, if you're grandfathered in and you say, you know, I'm not gonna take those exams anymore or the very noble people who say, I don't have to take it, but I'm gonna keep up and I'm gonna sit for one of these exams. And Laura, if you could just let me know. Uh, when you have closed the poll, I don't know why I'm not seeing the results of these myself. Go ahead, I just closed it. Okay, can you share the results and, and, and actually read them out because I, I can't see them for some reason. Absolutely. So um, answer A, received 25% of the votes. Answer B, 50%. Answer C, 13%. Answer D, 0 Answer E, 13%. Okay. Um, yes, I know that it's just generic questions, so we can keep re-polling. Um, so you'll just see the, the letter choices, the actual answers corresponding to those are on the slides themselves. So a large number of you are still in training. Good to know 50% of you are like me taking your general medicine boards. So I hope that some of these reviews are going to be helpful for you. And I'm gonna present some cases and these are taken right out of the medical knowledge self-assessment program, the most recent edition, MixApp 18. So here's a case, 48 year old man is evaluated during a follow-up visit for hypertension. He has no symptoms. He received the Tdap nine years ago and the flu shot during the most recent flu season. He's a current smoker with a 25 pack year history. His only medication is chlorothalidone. On physical exam, vitals are normal and the remainder is unremarkable. So which of the following is the most appropriate vaccine to administer to this patient? If you could launch the poll, please. Is it recombinant zoster, TD booster, 13 valent pneumococcal vaccine, 23 valent, or no vaccines indicated at this time. I'm going to have a good percentage of our audience having answered. Please share the results, Laura. Okay, A, 3%, B, 16%, C, 13%, D, 29%, E, 34%. Okay, and a very interesting. So a, a range, right? All of them got some votes. Um, the most responses were for E, no vaccines indicated. Um, the correct answer is, however, D. Um, so about a quarter or more of you got that correct. The 23 valent pneumococcal polysaccharide, <clears throat> that's what we know as pneumovax. Um, so don't feel bad. I got this one wrong the first time I went through two. I also chose E. So let's talk about why uh, actually giving the Pneumovax is, is the best choice for this patient. Um, you probably are aware, well, first, just to discount some of the, the first answers. The Zoster vaccine is indicated for any adult 50 or older. Um, it's irrespective of immune status now because this is the recombinant inactivated vaccine. Previously, we had a live zoster vaccine, which could only be given to immunocompetent patients. And that was recommended starting at age 60. But the current recommendations now are for any adult 50 or older, irrespective of previous immunization, or even if they had shingles in the past. The uh, TD booster, um, it's recommended that every adult get at least once of the Tdap, a pertussis containing vaccine, and thereafter, um, at least the tetanus and diphtheria toxoid boosters every 10 years. This guy um, got his just nine years ago, so he's not due um, for another year, okay? So why one of the pneumococcal vaccines? All right, so 
this is a bit of a busy slide, but this is directly from the most recent update to the immunization tables published by the ACIP. This just came out um, a, a month or so ago. And the color coding is the thing to focus on. Yellow are recommended for all adults if they meet the age criteria. Purple are for patients who have certain additional risk factors. Blue is consider offering this um, in the, what they call shared clinical decision-making model. Okay, so if you can focus, if I could focus your attention here on the Numavax, the, the polysaccharide one, the 23 valent, um, you can see that it's only yellow recommended for everybody over age 65. So that's probably why I didn't choose it and why a bunch of you didn't choose it. But purple, for certain patients with additional risk factors, it is recommended. Who are some of those patients? This is the second table, and you can see across the top, I apologize that this is a small print perhaps, but pregnancy, immunocompromising conditions, asplenia, chronic medical conditions, et cetera, those all can be considered um, as additional risk factors. But our patient doesn't fall into any of those categories either. So I had to actually go back to the original recommendations or, or the latest update concerning pneumococcal vaccination. This is from 2012. The ACIP publishes their recommendations in the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And so here you can see chronic heart failure, lung disease, et cetera. These are for immunocompetent patients, but who have underlying conditions that if they contracted pneumococcal disease, they would have poor outcomes. They could have more severe disease. We'll look down at the bottom of this list and cigarette smoking is listed as well. Our patient is a smoker. And so he actually has an indication for receiving the 23 valent only. Okay, now, if you look, some other patients have in addition the recommendation to get the 13 valent that we call Prevnar, okay? People with CSF leaks and cochlear implants, I think that's actually more for preventing pneumococcal meningitis rather than pneumonia. And then things that make sense, a, patients with asplenia, pneumococcus is an encapsulated organism, so it makes sense that they would be at increased risk. And here's a number of other immunocompromising conditions, HIV, some of the congenital or acquired immunodeficiency that includes when we put them on immunosuppressant drugs, chronic renal failure, the hematologic malignancies for Dr. Sakaris and his colleagues, in him, all of those are high risk, and those patients should receive both the 13 valent and the 23 valent. Now, for those patients, the recommendation is to get the 13 valent first. Um, the reason is that although it covers less strains of pneumococcus, it actually had some higher efficacy rates in the range of about 75% um, compared to the Pneumovax, which was more like 60, 65, 70% at the top. Little editorial comment, uh, I was thinking back to when the COVID vaccines came out and you know there was all the hubbub about their tremendous efficacy, at least the Pfizer and Moderna ones, greater than 90% was unheard of practically. And then Johnson & Johnson got poo-pooed because it was only in the 70s range when that's actually quite acceptable efficacy for a lot of our vaccines. Back to our standard recommendation for immunocompetent adults age 65 or older, um, it's also recommended that we offer them the 13-valent conjugate vaccine first if they haven't previously already received it, uh, the pneumococcal vaccination. They should then be separated by a year. Um, and so the following year, you could give them the pneumovax, okay? Uh, to backtrack a little bit for the immunocompromised people that you give both, you only separate it by eight weeks, and then they should get a booster probably five years later after the Pneumovax. So key takeaway from that one is think about your younger smokers um, who otherwise are healthy, but they still could be offered early pneumococcal vaccination. So let's try another case. 22-year-old man is evaluated for a pre-employment examination. He's starting a new job as a registered nurse. He's asymptomatic. He got his Tdap seven years ago and the flu shot during the last season. Approximately six months ago, he also got a dose of MMR, 
um, because they did serologic testing and he didn't have adequate antibody titers. Medical history is negative for chronic medical conditions. He's a non-smoker and doesn't plan to travel outside the US in the near future. He takes no medications. His physical exam is normal. The other serologies uh, that they also um, performed showed that he had a positive result for hep B surface antibody, but a negative hep B surface antigen and core antibody and a negative hep A IgG. So which of the following is the most appropriate vaccination strategy for this healthcare worker? Please launch the poll. And when we have a good number answered, please share those results. So we have A, 6%. B, 78%, C and D were both zero, and E, 17%. Okay, very interesting. So the correct answer here is A, a second dose of MMR. Again, don't feel bad. I got this one wrong too. I did exactly what the majority of folks here did, and I answered hepatitis A, right? Healthcare worker, possible exposure to body fluids, increased risk, that made sense to me. So why is MMR uh, the better answer? Well, nobody voted for the hep B. Uh, that was good because he is immune. He's probably been vaccinated. He has antibody only, not surface antigen or core antibody. So he was vaccinated already. No need to repeat that. That is recommended, of course, for healthcare workers. And uh, we already talked about indications for the, the pneumovax. He doesn't have them. This guy's not a smoker, okay? So the MMR is indicated for all immunocompetent adults born in the US from 1957 or later um, who lack documented immunity. So in this, this is a case where history isn't enough. You actually have to check the serologies to see if they have adequate titers, okay? Um, we, I notice I said immunocompetent adults. We don't give this to immunocompromised patients, at least severely immunocompromised ones, because MMR is a live attenuated vaccine, okay? So that's for everyone, at least one dose for adults. Now, other people at increased risk should get a second dose um, at least 28 days after the first, okay? And healthcare workers are among those at increased risk. The same is true for others like college students, international travelers, um, and so forth. Now, here's the recommendation, again, from the MMR, MMWR, of those recommended vaccines for health professionals. So hep B again makes sense, possible needle sticks and so forth, but all the rest, influenza, MMR, pertussis and varicella are spread by respiratory droplets. So the concern is not only are they at increased risk of contracting it, but of spreading it to their patients in the healthcare uh, setting. And that's why uh, this patient should get another dose of MMR. Now, in terms of hep A vaccination, um, who is, recommended to get that, of course, are people who live or work in endemic areas, um, close household contacts of recent adoptees from endemic areas where Hep A is, is performed, those with chronic liver disease, men who have sex with men, uh, illicit drug use, et cetera. Healthcare workers aren't specifically in there, but one of the recent rec uh, updates to the Hep A vaccination recommendations is that any adult who requests it could be offered it. So if this guy wanted to get Hep A, we could vaccinate, but that's not in the standard recommendations here. Okay, another case. 23 year old woman, she's here for a routine wellness visit. She got her Tdap at age 18. She got the meningococcal conjugate vaccine at 11 and a booster at 16 years old. And she got her flu shot during the last year. She's single, lives in an apartment with a roommate and is a non-smoker. She has no upcoming travel plans, no chronic medical problems and take no meds. And her physical exam is normal. Which of the following vaccinations should be offered to this patient? Please launch the poll. Any other Jeopardy fans besides me? 
All right, Laura, um, could you share the results, please? Sure. So we have A, 90%, B, 7%, C, 3%. Okay, excellent. Well done, everyone. Um, so the majority of folks got this one correct. The correct answer is the human papilloma vaccine, HPV. Okay. Um, maybe that's in the context of our previous discussion. So we already talked about um, she doesn't meet criteria for the Pneumovax. She's had her Tdap um, within uh, the past 10 years. Um, so she has a couple years more on that. So for a couple of people who chose the meningococcal vaccine, I wanted to talk about that just, just for a moment. Um, it's recommended um, that everybody get the primary series in adolescence, just as she did, two shots before age 18. And when we talk about the quadrivalent conjugate vaccine, that's the one that covers strains A, C, W, and Y. Okay? A booster is recommended in certain patients who are at increased risk, uh, which I'll discuss in a second, but she doesn't meet any of those criteria. Okay, and so HPV is the best answer for her, and I'll come back to that in just a second. So who are the people that should get a booster of the meningococcal vaccine? Um, we should also, besides the conjugate vaccine against those four strains, also a recent recommendation is to consider vaccination against the meningitis, a meningococcus B vaccine, okay? If they are at increased risk, I'm gonna show that on the next slide, a booster while they remain at risk um, is recommended every five years. So who are these people? Um, meningococcus is another encapsulated organism. So it makes sense that patients with asplenia would be at increased risk. We should vaccinate them for, against the four strains and against meningococcus B. Okay, we give the quadrivalent one very early on in childhood. The meningococcal B vaccine is recommended starting at age 10. Okay, complement deficiencies. That's part of how our body would handle meningococcal infection. Or nowadays, the complement inhibitors, things like eculizumab. So for those of you who use some of the biologics that could uh, inhibit complement, those patients should also be vaccinated against meningococcus. HIV and other things. Now notice at the bottom, military recruits, um, college freshmen, we know that there are meningitis outbreaks in conjugate living facilities. And so these are things that are required before going to live in a dorm, et cetera. She didn't meet any of those criteria. So again, um, the best answer for her was to receive the HPV vaccine. This is recommended for all adolescents. Um, the recommended ages would be at 11 or 12 years old, but if they weren't given then, they could be given up to age 26, okay? It's now one of the recent updates to this recommendation is it's the same upper age limit for both men and women used to be that men had a, a younger cutoff, 21 years. Now it's simplified, it's harmonized. And just remember, age 26 is standard recommendation. So she, she had not received HPV vaccination earlier. She's only 25 years old. She should receive it now. There's some consideration for individuals who are older, even up to age 45, based on, again, shared clinical decision-making. Are they at risk? If they haven't had much sexual activity and therefore little or no exposure to HPV earlier, they would be good candidates to receive the HPV vaccine um, even later in life. But a little side note here, whenever you get into the range of consider and discuss with your patient, sometimes insurance uh, doesn't cover those things. And I'll come back to that if I have time. The standard dosing in um, early adolescence is two dose series. Since this patient is over age 15, it would be three doses. Just some general considerations to wrap up in immunizations. We usually give these in the deltoid, that's for sub-Q or IM injections. Interestingly, the meningococcal vaccine that I was talking about has decreased immunogenicity if it's administered in the gluteal muscle. Anticoagulation is not a contraindication to vaccination, even for the IM injection. So one of my coworkers actually, who has a congenital cardiac problem and is on anticoagulation, was told by his cardiologist not to get the COVID vaccine um, because he was worried about bleeding there. Studies have not demonstrated any increased bleeding risk, even from IM injections. You can give more than one vaccine on the same day. Generally, it's going to be limited to two, one in each arm. Um, and that's okay for most vaccines. Some of these little board tips, if I want to give those for the large number of you who have to retake your boards all the time. We don't give the immuno, uh, 
compromised patients or pregnant women the live virus vaccines. And some of those are listed here, MMR, varicella, intranasal flu, and again, the live zoster isn't even marketed in the US anymore. Right? Final note, Healthy People 2020 is a campaign to try to increase awareness of the need to immunize adults. We've done very well immunizing children in this country, and we've been making good progress in our senior citizens, age 65 and older, getting them their recommended shots. But it's that younger adult population that sometimes doesn't get all of the vaccines that are recommended. If you have any concerns about keeping up with this confusing uh, list of schedules, I recommend this app. I have it on my, on my phone. Um, it's directly from the CDC. It has nice color coding that follows that same printed schedule. You can search by age and see what the recommended vaccines are or by medical condition. It tells you the contraindications and precautions. There's hyperlinks that, you know, give you the vaccine name and then boop, the, do the dose, specific doses pop up. Um, lots of links to good resources. And importantly, it's constantly updated. So uh, new recommendations that come from the ACIP will be pushed to the app. And so you'll always be up to date. Now that last case, I'm gonna shift gears here just very briefly and talk about cancer screening. Um, you know, the reason we do HPV vaccination at all is because it's to prevent cervical cancers primarily. The vast majority of those are caused by chronic HPV infection. Also a substantial number of anal and oral pharyngeal cancers are also caused by HPV. I'm not gonna get into the details here. Aaron Marcus, my colleague in general internal medicine did a great grand rounds on this topic couple of years ago. And these are still the current recommendations that she discussed from 2018. That was the last update to cancer screening um, out of the US Preventive Services Task Force until last month. And that's when they came up with a new recommendation. So my final polling question, for which of the following patients does the US Preventive Services Task Force currently recommend annual lung cancer screening with low dose CT scan? Please launch the poll. And let me know when you have a good percentage answered and share those results, please. 0%. Okay, so the majority went for B, two thirds of you. C though had a sizable chunk. Um, the majority rules, the wisdom of the crowd, excellent. So you are all up to date perhaps on these newest recommendations. This patient who's 50 years old with a 25 year pack year smoking history and who quit five years ago. So what are the recommendations? Um, this shows the previous lung cancer screening recommendations from the Preventive Task Force came out in 2013. Those had a lower age threshold of 55 years old and required a 30 pack year history. Those have now been lowered to starting at 50 years old and those who have a cumulative 20 pack year history. Age and smoking history are the leading risk factors for lung cancer. Um, and that's why these recommendations were made to increase the number of patients that are eligible for screening. This is a grade B recommendation from the Preventive Services Task Force, which means that there's moderate certainty that the net benefit is at least moderate. These are just some of the stats to back up this recommendation. The number needed to screen to prevent one cancer death, depending on which of the studies you look at, ranges from 130 to 300 and something. So let's pick a middle number, say about 200 patients you screen, you can save one cancer death. The reduction in mortality is about 25 to 15 to 25%. There are some possible harms over diagnosis leading to invasive procedures and so forth, but most of the studies that formed the backdrop for this recommendation were done before our current guidelines on how you work up and follow a pulmonary nodule. So they say that using current protocols um, will mitigate some of those potential harms. So it's probably even lower than that. Um, eligibility. Okay, we, we have, you really need to wrap up, Dr. Scalise. Yeah. This was excellent, but this unfortunately it's one o'clock. All right, this is the last slide. So one of the very interesting things that besides increasing eligibility is that it may decrease disparities so that more women and more people of color who have been underscreened um, would be eligible under these new criteria. So that is 
the, the key take homes here are remember to vaccinate uh, your smokers with Pneumovax, um, screen your healthcare workers for certain infections that they're at higher risk, review your immunization history for those younger patients and offer the appropriate vaccines and bear in mind these new lung cancer screening recommendations. I'll be happy to answer any emailed questions to me uh, after the fact. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. That was great. That was just a wonderful review. And all of us uh, need to take heed to that because we're all doing MOCs, I hope. Um, this is wonderful. Thank you. And I thank Dr. Sekaris for two really great grand rounds today. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. And in the meantime, uh, don't forget to fill out the CME at the end. Be well. Thank you. Stay well, everyone.